The reading is taken from James chapter 1, verses 17 through to 27. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind, a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues, is it, continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Heavenly Father, please be with me as I speak. Lord, give me the words that you want me to say. And please help these words to go deep into ourselves, into myself, into all of us, and help us to learn so that we can grow closer, ever closer to you. Amen. So again, good morning. Good morning, everybody. I was thinking I was going to be talking to um, me and the mouse and the vicar, basically, because it's, you know, it's Bank Holiday Sunday. So it's wonderful to see everybody here. Thank you for coming. And everybody at home as well, of course. So this morning we're taking our first look at this letter of James. Um, I did do a little bit of reading about it, you'll be pleased to know. But I couldn't really find out who this James was. Some people say maybe it was one of the two disciples that uh, were with Jesus, or maybe it was Jesus' brother James. But whoever it was, he just signed the letter James. So he expected people to know who he was. And he wrote a wonderfully practical letter of how to be a Christian, how to grow as a Christian, and in my mind, how to keep checking up on yourself and see how that growing was going. He wrote the letter to, well, young churches, Jewish Christians who had been persecuted and were now spread out through the Mediterranean world. They needed to hear this letter. And just because this wonderful Bible we have is the living word of God. We need to hear this letter too today, just the same. So what is he saying? How do we grow as Christians? When we turn to Jesus in the first place and he holds us in his arms and we turn to him and we give ourselves to him, we're born again. We are baby Christians young Christians. We can't stay that way. We've got to keep moving. It doesn't matter what age we come to God. 
Remember Nicodemus and Jesus, you have to be born again. But we can't stay that way. So how do we grow? How do we mature? And James says the way to do it is to hear God's word, receive it, and then obey it. Verse 21 says, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So first of all, we've got to repent. We want to take in God's word, we want to read it, we want to learn by it, but we have to repent because inside us there's all the filth and the rubbish and the nonsense of being human. One of the books said that this word for filth was the Greek word rupus, which meant wax in your ears. Now, whether it was an April Fool, I don't know. But actually, it means an awful lot of sense to me, because if you have got wax in your ears, you can't hear anything. If you've got rubbish and filth and all that sort of gunk inside you, how can you take in the good stuff? So repentance comes first. It's like a spring clean. Of course, it just doesn't happen once. It happens throughout our lives. This spring cleaning. So we can take in the good stuff of God. So we study God's word. We listen, we hear, we read. But more than that, it's a sort of taking it within ourselves, a welcoming it. You know, I was old enough to do O-levels. I learned an awful lot of stuff by heart in those days. And I was good at O-levels because I could write fast and I had a good memory. But I don't remember a word of it now. You could know your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, verse by verse, completely off by heart, but that wouldn't make you any more like Jesus. Yes, we have to read, and yes, we have to study, and yes, that's great. But there's more to it than that. There's the the taking in God's word into our very selves, the keeping going with it, the questioning it, yes, in meekness, because we know it's right, but we've got to get there. We've got to question. We've got to talk to each other. We've got to look at books. We've got to hear good sermons. We've got to, yeah, we've got to persevere. We've really got to take this thing into ourselves so that we can believe it for ourselves, absorb it. James says this lovely thing about it mustn't be like the casual glance when you look in the mirror. I tell you, when you get to my age, the glance gets more and more casual every day. But no, it's not like that. It's got to be the constant gaze. You mustn't forget it. We've got to look into it. We've got to believe it. We've got to know it deep in our souls. So yes, read. Yes, of course, read and hear. But take it in. Study. Study and believe. And then, actually, we've got to obey it. We've got to do what it says. James says in the next chapter that faith without deeds is dead. We're not saved by our deeds. We're saved already, of course. But if we believe all that wonderful stuff that Jesus did for us, is doing for us right now, and will do for us in the future, how can we not want to thank him and praise him and live for him and do what he wants us to do? How can we not obey him? How can we not? And then those last two verses. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
Yes, we've got to read, we've got to study, we've got to learn, we've got to take it in, we've got to obey and do the deeds he wants us to do. But I also think there's something about keeping checking up. How are we doing? Are we moving in the right direction? Are we standing still? Are we still babies? Are we moving? And how can we keep checking up? Our faith to grow and to move mustn't be superficial. It mustn't be an illusion. As James says, it mustn't be a deceit. It has to be real. It has to be deep. So how can we check? Does it lack restraint? Does it lack results? Are we too influenced by the world? We've got to be honest about ourselves, because if we're not honest about ourselves, how can we ask God for the help we need? How can we find out what we really need? I'm going to get a bit personal now. We, uh, sometimes we shouldn't be personal, but this happened this week, and to me, it brought this home so much to me. And this is what happened. I read this a couple of weeks ago to sort of get myself thinking and praying about what I was going to say today. And this verse 26, when I, I, I really do think it's about checking up, where are we going, how are we doing, and there was the bridling one's tongue, keeping a tight rein on one's tongue, there was looking after the needy, and there was not being polluted by the world. And I looked at that verse about bridling one's tongue, and I thought, do you know... I know it's important, I've read all the things about your tongue, you can't take it back once you've said it, once it's out there, you've done the damage or you've done the good. You can build up or you can destroy, yes, I know. But is, why is it first? Why is it before helping the needy or being polluted by the world? You know, I was questioning, as I should, I know. Well, my husband hasn't been well, and um, I've put myself second only to Florence Nightingale in my skills as a nurse. I've never actually had to nurse before, and I don't find it easy, but practically, I think I've been doing pretty well. Um, and it came to Monday, and he'd asked for something for tea, which I got, and which he didn't eat, and then it was 7.15, and he said, I'm going to bed now. And before I bridled my tongue, I said, wow, what a joy life is. What a joy life is, I said. Okay. Okay, there were lots of apologies and hugs and a few tears. And I went to bed and uh, prayed a lot and said sorry to God. And then I thought about this verse about bridling the tongue. And I thought, yes, of course I should never have said that. It should never have come out of my mouth. But it actually showed what was in my heart. I'd been putting on this wonderful act and the mask came down. And I was doing this wonderful nursing job. And everything was fine on the surface. But what came out of my mouth suddenly made me look at my heart. Because what was going on in here was anguish, pain, worry, fear. And unless that had come out of my mouth, which I'm not suggesting it should have, but if it hadn't come out of my mouth, I would never have looked at what was going on in my heart and soul. And how can you do anything about it unless you realise what's there and you bring it to God. I can only say to you that I think what you should do is go and scream at a tree or make bread and knead a lot or do something like that. Don't let it come out. But be honest with ourselves. How can we grow as Christians if we're not honest with ourselves about what is going on in here and ask for help? So yeah, keep checking what's in here. What's in here? What do I need help with? 
What do I really need to bring to God? Verse 27, yeah. Obviously, how are we? How are we? What are the results of us being Christian? Are we helping the poor and needy? Gosh, Afghanistan. What can we do? We can pray, we can give. What can we do? Speak to Am. There's so many places in the world that need our prayers, need our donations, need our, our help, whatever that can be. And then just look around here. You know, we're doing these, these questionnaires, we're doing this thinking and praying about what we can do around St. Stephen's and what we can do about, around this church St. Bart's. You know, this, these communities... It's not just poor and needy with lack of resources. It's poor and needy with lack of God. What can we do? And then keep oneself from being polluted by the world. (laughs) Oh, that's a biggie. Gosh, that's a biggie. How do you keep yourself from the values of the world? Well, gosh, we need God for that, don't we? The old saying, what would Jesus do before all decisions? Might be an old chestnut, but basically, I think it's still a great thing to do. What's driving what I want to do, what I want to say? What's driving me? Is it God? Is it right? Or is it the world? So, okay. It's amazing. This Bible we read, these, these living words of God, they came over as just words when I read them three weeks ago, two weeks ago. And then life shows us that this is God and he's speaking to me. And I hope he's speaking to you today. So, what's James saying? He's saying read, he's saying hear, He's saying inwardly digest, believe and obey, and then keep checking in. Could you put the doggy picture up, please? This is the ah moment. Ah, okay. This is the newest member of our family. He's called Hunter. When my son said he was getting a dog, well, a puppy, Uh, I was hoping for something black and fluffy, a bit like Nugget, you know, the Briggs's dog. And we got a Vizsla. Um, We're told he's going to be a wonderful family dog. But the word there is dog. At the moment, he's puppy. He's eight weeks old. He shouldn't have been on the settee, and he definitely shouldn't have had that blanket. He's now 18 weeks old. He comes to about here and he's still growing in his paws, and he's going to be about to my waist. He's a hunting dog. He's terribly affectionate. He lies on my lap, or rather across my lap, and he licks my neck. I'm never very relaxed because I think he's going for the carotid artery. He is a hunting dog after all. So it's not really relaxing. But he is beautiful. He, he really is a beautiful dog. But he is a puppy. He's a puppy. He's full of life, he's energetic, he's trouble, and he's very hard work. But one day he'll be a dog. He'll never be a lap dog. He'll never be one of those that Parisian ladies carry around in their handbag. He'd need an awfully big handbag anyway, but you know what I mean. He's going to be still full of life. He's going to be vigorous. He's going to be loving but I think he's probably still going to be trouble. When we think about ourselves, we started off as Christian babies, Christian children. We want to leave the childish things behind and we want to become Christian adults. We don't want to be lap dogs. We definitely don't want to be doormats. But we've got to leave the children thing behind. We've got to leave babyhood behind. We've had a look at how James suggests we do it. But as we change and we 
grow and we keep on that journey to adulthood. We still want to be full of life. We still want to be energetic. We still want to be full of God's love. In fact, we want to be more and more and more full of God's love. That's why we're growing. The closer we get to God, the more we'll know God's love for us and how wonderful that will be. But I still want to be energetic. I still want to be vigorous. I still want to work with him more and more and more, and I want him to be working in me. But I have a feeling that I'm still going to get into trouble. Amen.